Ooh, we're all under quarantine. And you can't touch this. You can't. Stop texting me. Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. And it's time for another edition of Let's Argue, where I hop on the internet, I take your hot takes, your unpopular opinions, your tough questions. I asked all of you what in your opinion, uh, what, what is the most underrated album? Not in terms of score or anything, but reception, general discussion acceptance into the, the the great music canon. Let's go. It was written. While I agree Illmatic is more influential album, I think Nas really perfected his craft as a writer, MC, and storyteller with It Was Written. The message, I gave you power, the setup, If I Ruled the World, etc. are some of his most substance, complex songs in his discography. It Was Written further solidified him as a living legend. What I'll say is there are a lot of hip-hop fans out there who, for whatever reason, seem to be under the impression that Nas only has one good album. It Was Written actually has, like, more topical and focused songwriting than a lot of tracks on uh, Illmatic. And Illmatic is a fantastic album. And the aesthetics of that record are very pure and very wonderful and representative of a time, a place. That being said, um, Nas really matured quite a bit on It Was Written as a songwriter. And while amongst actual hip-hop heads, the record is well-received and does get a lot of praise, I think generally uh, it's, it's not as widely understood as it should be that uh, the greatness of Nas's discography does go beyond Illmatic. Uh, it at least stretches to It Was Written. <laughs> Government Plates is super underrated. Everyone out here acting like every song on there doesn't go hard AF, plus the way the songs all flow into each other makes it feel so much more cohesive than most of their albums. It kicks off really well, and it has some amazing highlights too, I do not deny that. There are some cool ideas on Government Plates too, but I think there are a lot of tracks on there that are just redundant as hell to the point where they just get a little annoying, and on top of that, I just wish uh, a Ride vocally and lyrically played a, a, a slightly larger role in uh, in the record, and that's all. That is all. Darkness on the Edge of Town. It's far better than any other Springsteen album lyrically and musically. I will agree to the extent that it's a lot more raw in terms of performance and energy on uh, on that record. What, what is that Kane song on there? He is screaming his brains out on that track like he's freaking Tom Waits, uh, which that's not something you hear often on a Springsteen record. Uh, it's not nearly as pristine or as clean or as anthemic as like all the Born in, in USA shit. That being said, uh, the album is, is very much accepted as being uh, like one of his best. Uh, so I don't know so much if it's underrated. I mean, obviously, people who are new to the Springsteen scene don't really know about that. They're most likely going to have, like, Born in the USA thrown into their face first. But uh, still, it's a pretty critically acclaimed release. I, I wouldn't say it's technically underrated. Uh, maybe just uh, underexplored uh, by uh, uh, maybe newer listeners who, uh, who might be into a little bit of Springsteen, but maybe not the whole discography. Lulu by Metallica and Lou Reed. Great, powerful riffs, disturbing and weird vocals, and interestingly disturbing uh, lyrics. Honestly, it's a lot better than people give it credit. I agree. It's overhated, and mostly because Lou Reed's vocals and Metallica's thrash metal style, it's a very weird combination that not everybody wants to listen to, but I happen to like how absurd and odd the juxtaposition is. While I think the production and Metallica's performances uh, could have been better on that record, I think Lou put a lot of heart into just how freaky uh, the poetry on that album is. And in his own way, I think he did his best to uh, uh, sort of complement a more metal style uh, with his writing. The type of audience that a Metallica backing brings you, uh, that, that's not necessarily like the type of audience that you want listening to a Lou Reed. Like, most likely the same group of people who hate Lulu uh, would also hate The Raven, and that's fine, that's fair, you know, that's, you, you were never meant to like it anyway. I don't know what to tell you, like, like Lou Reed, especially like late era Lou Reed is, is not uh, for everybody. This album is very underrated, I don't see anyone talking about it. I has very good production from Dr. Dre, and a 
lot of great songs with some good lyrics and dope beats. Some great features from Eminem and Snoop Dogg and Nate Dogg. Yeah, Exhibit doesn't get, I think, uh, enough respect as far as 2000s rappers go. Uh, he, did, he did drop some stuff in the 90s, too. And in my opinion, uh, 40 Days and 40 Nights, the record he dropped previous to this one, is, is the superior album. But even that record doesn't really get uh, the attention that it deserves. Uh, back in the day, Exhibit was just a really raw, aggressive rapper who, uh, at his peak, creatively, I think, had a lot of uh, uh, intense energy to him uh, that was really admirable and really exciting. Unfortunately, I don't really think that energy translates onto Restless. I feel like this record, uh, when he transitioned into the slightly more mainstream sound that uh, this project presents, his style and his delivery, what it once was, came off just a little neutered. Um, and, and I think some of the songs on this thing are kind of weak, frankly. Like that Nate Dog track, while the feature from Nate is pretty decent and it's cool that you know they, they cross paths in the way that they did on this uh, project it, it's not like the best song that Nate Dogg's ever been on uh, that being said the feature list generally on this thing Snoop M, KRS, uh, also Eric Sermon is on here too, is really impressive, certainly more impressive than um, a lot of feature lists for records from this decade, which uh, uh, for the most part were very heavy with uh, trendy appearances from rappers who none of y'all even fucking know now because <laughs> they came and went pretty quickly uh, once the decade was out. But still, yeah, I, I guess if uh, you're exhibit obsessed, uh, it, it could kind of get stuck in your craw that this record doesn't get uh, as much attention as, as maybe it could or it should uh, for some of the ideas in it. I mean, you, you don't want to throw some Dr. Dre produced record uh, down the drain. You, if, if you are a hip hop head, you do want to try that out. You, you do want to be curious about such a thing. Uh, but still, I, I think exhibit has put out some better stuff. Stereo Lab dots and loops. It combines elements of 60s pop, bossa nova, lounge, and futuristic electronic flawlessly making their blunt political messages digestible in the form of easy listening pop. Yes, 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 yes. I think generally anything Stereo Lab is a uh, pretty underrated. I mean, I, they, they represent a sect of the indie genre that for its time was so daring, so envelope pushing, uh, so adventurous and creative, uh, just like a real lack of boundaries conceptually to what a lot of artists of Stereolab's ilk were doing uh, back in the day. And, and I just feel like that's not as much the case anymore. Not to say that there's not an incredible amount of creativity going on in music generally today, there most certainly is, but I feel like a lot of it isn't really uh, focused into the indie scene like it used to be because these days I can't really think of a, a band that excites me in the way uh, that a good stereo Lab album does, at least coming out of the indie scene right now in the year of our Lord 2020 anyway. Everything our dear commenter here says is absolutely true. Uh, Stereo Lab's fusion, I will go a step further here, of uh, 60s pop and, and various genres is so futuristic and seamless, uh, it's pretty exciting. You know, it, it seems like even today, a lot of tracks off of this record, uh, it's, it's like they're five or six years ahead of the curve. Village, Green, Preservation Society by the Kinks, or any Kinks record from uh, 1966 to 72. Large ignored during the British invasion and hardly talked about now besides the occasional use in a Wes Anderson film. Nobody's talking about the kinks these days? That kind of sucks. When I went through a bit of a classic rock period and was going through a lot of 60s and 70s shit. The Kinks were uh, one of my favorite groups for a little bit, though I will say uh, they're more sunshine pop records, notably this album that you've brought up here. Uh, while it very much ticks a lot of the same boxes that you would want in that genre of music. Um, they don't make for some of my favorite LPs in that style. I'm much more a Lola guy. I think uh, the band's seven, you know, early 70s stuff was a lot more versatile and, um, and adventurous, not so much one note, one dimensional. I guess generally in terms of the tears of the British invasion, the kinks do sort of pop in on the lower end. They're not as uh, uh, respected or as paid attention to as like The Who or The Stones, but... Uh, still, in, in my own mind, I would, I would like to think they're there, 
There, there. Sing to God by Cardiacs. Mind-blowing songs that defy any genre labels. Cardiacs have always had an interesting but unique sound, but this album was beyond anything that had been done before. The album goes from beautiful neo-psych to blistering art-punk bangers, and also includes one of the best rock anthems of all time, Sing to God. I think the record's okay. It's got some good elements on it, and uh, it, it is a very zany, wild, out there, very heavy and abrasive uh, type of album, but I don't know if I would go as far as to say it's like uh, the, totally unlike anything that came before it. I mean, Naked City did drop quite a while uh, before that record, and Naked City I think is even more abrasive, wild, and um, a lot less hokey. And there are elements of uh, Sing to God I do think are, are kind of hokey and maybe a little annoying in a sense, uh, as, as uh, daring and as uh, left field as many ideas on the record are. I don't know if I would say the album is like underrated. Um, it has a pretty strong cult following to it. A lot of diehard fans. I don't know if it should be like seen as like one of the greatest rock records of all time or anything like that. The, though I understand if you feel that way personally. Tom Waits closing time. I hear people talk about swordfish trombones and rain dogs all the time. But I feel that closing time is one of the most well-constructed and aesthetically pleasing albums of all time. The mellow drunken crudes of Tom Waits and straightforward but intoxicating lyrics and melody uh, come together seamlessly to build an incredible album deserves to be viewed as a classic in my opinion. I will say generally I don't really care for the sad sack bar fly piano man Tom Waits era. There are uh, very few exceptions to that rule. Nighthawks the Diner is one. That record is great. Heart Attack and Vine is pretty dope as well. And Closing Time is another example too, although that is maybe my least favorite of the three. Uh, there's some very good songs on that album. I will not deny that, but I just don't really see that record as aesthetic pleasing as um, some people do. I just think a lot of elements of it are kind of bland. Tom would go on to do so much cooler stuff. And it's funny because there are some Tom Waits covers albums out there and whenever I do find one it's always disappointing to see like why are half of these fucking tracks off closing time? Do you guys not know that he has an entire discography like <laughs> beyond this point? I don't know what what uh what it takes to be a Tom Waits fan that's just like so die hard for closing time because I am I'm just like so far into like you know I'm I'm not even I'm not even like at Rain Dogs. Rain Dogs is amazing, but I'm I'm like in real gone. Give me real fucking gone. Give me mule variations. Give me blood money Tom Waits. <laughs> Divorce Lawyers, I Shaved My Head, absolutely soul-crushing album that deals in topics that were honestly really progressive for 2009, with explicit but poetic talk of gender dysphoria and all the anxiety and depression that comes along with it. I hear very little praise of this album in current indie circles, and that's kind of depressing to me, because I feel like it's a record that has the potential to be iconic. You know, it's funny, because around 2009, that record didn't get as much hype as maybe it should have, and then people were catching on to it a little later, and around the time that people were catching on to it, I was getting tons of fucking messages uh, from people just saying, have you heard this album? It's amazing. It's great. It's fantastic. And um, while I think Jordan Mason's work on this uh, on this one is not bad, it's not a bad record, and, and I will give it to you here, like the lyrics and the narrative and uh, some of the vocals are easily the best thing that it has going for it. Uh, but in a lot of ways, I, I just see the instrumentation, the recording, the aesthetics of the record to just be like very boilerplate, somewhat lo-fi indie folk. Just instrumentally and aesthetically, it's not that exciting to me. So uh, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of a wash for me. I wouldn't say it's necessarily that underrated. It has a strong cult following. And um, I don't know if it's so much the case in 2020, but uh, for a certain amount of time, like I saw that record getting rated and charted like by hardcore, you know, music fans everywhere. And I don't know if people have sort of phased out of the album a little bit or whatever, but uh, if, if you have, I mean, maybe that's a shame because uh, if you've loved it, I, I see no reason not to continue loving it. Uh, it just personally didn't really hit for me. And introducing by DJ Shadow. No one talks about how brilliant this album is. It's, it's literally the most widely respected instrumental hip-hop record of all time. Maybe the record isn't as widely discussed as it could or should be because instrumental hip-hop isn't the most popular genre out there, though even in like IDM circles there's a ton of respect for introducing. It's not underrated. <laughs> 
that's, it's really not underrated. Trial by Verbal Assault is the most underrated hardcore slash punk album of all time. As forgotten as it is now, that album was a huge turning point for the genre. In the Northeast, during the late 80s, they were one of the first hardcore punk bands to use the combination of groove, time changes, and melody that became central to post-hardcore in the 90s. That album influenced everyone from Gorilla Biscuits to Quicksand uh, to Fugazi. Ian Mackay even said they were the only hardcore band he cared about back in the late 80s. And they were one of the few first wave hardcore bands who survived the second wave and evolved the new sound alongside Cro-Mag, Slapshot, Underdog, and Yacht, or Youth of Today. Yeah, honestly, before your comment, I had not heard that goddamn album, and I am a pretty big post-hardcore fan and a Ian Mackay nut, uh, gave a listen to the LP, and um, while I'm not entirely sure uh, about the sort of musical map, the, the genome, the anthropology you have laid out here in terms of like the influences and connections and everything, uh, it does sound really fucking ahead of the curve as far as like hardcore and post-hardcore go. It's a really dynamic sound and I love a lot of the riffs. The band's energy is incredible. The recording is pretty good too. Um, certainly an 80s hardcore album that I can totally get behind and one that uh, after this video I'm going to need to probably spend more time listening to. So yeah, I would say uh, probably underrated as fuck. Uh, given that I've never heard of it, and uh, I don't really see a whole lot of people talking about it either. We have Nick Reinhardt here, of Terra Mello's fame, bitch, uh, saying the cardigans long gone before daylight after Gran Turismo, Nina Person dyed her hair black, and they wrote a bunch of depressing slash dark songs, no sign of love, fool, pop, or erase the, or, and rewind electro, uh, just moody alt sadness released in Sweden in 2003. Yeah, I mean, listening to the LP, uh, that's totally the case. It's actually very beautiful, and uh, I will say the cardigans are kind of interesting in that uh, generally their discography is pretty underrated outside side of their most relevant hits. It's like a, it's like a tale of two bands because um, given their most popular songs, you wouldn't really take them for a group that did indie pop and like jangle pop, but those styles were pretty central to their sound outside of, again, their, their biggest hits and everything. And uh, it's amazing that you've taken the time to sort of write so passionately about uh, uh, this section of their discography over here, given that uh, across the board, I, I think uh, uh, there's, ve there's very much a bird's eye view on the cardigans uh, because of their hits, uh, when there's actually some really cool uh, records in their discography that are worthy of a closer inspection. So, yeah, under fucking rated. I'm such a baby, who oh, the dolphins make me cry. But there's nothing I can do. I've been looking for. And I think we are going to leave it at that everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, this has been my thoughts on a lot of underrated albums you threw in my way, threw in my face. I hope y'all are doing well, and uh, hopefully got some good recommendations of maybe some uh, albums and artists that either you hadn't heard or hadn't uh, considered maybe taking the time to uh, listen to or re-examine. Uh, you're the best. Anthony Fantano, underrated albums forever.